Hi there. Phase London is finally back after a two-year break caused by the coronavirus pandemic. And some of the works on display are a reflection of that period. Here's all the latest from the event. This work by artist Doho So reflects his connection to home, where for almost two years he had to spend more time than usual because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Just like other artists featured at this year's Freeze London. Though there are many themes to explore, one being climate change. Artistic director Eva Longray says it's one of the fair's top priorities. So this year we're very happy to collaborate with uh, Gallery Climate Coalition. Uh, we have given a space to the organisation at the fair where they're providing information to galleries and to visitors about how to help with reducing their impact, um, uh, their environmental impact. Uh, and then also we have a collaboration with uh, Platform Earth which is an organisation raising funds uh, to support uh, um, causes that have to do with climate change. Art lovers and art buyers should also know the fair has invited 160 galleries from 40 countries to present their collections. And Long Grey tells us more about what to expect. I'm standing here in uh, the section that is curated by Cédric Fauque, who is a chief curator at CAPC Bordeaux. So this is a special section with 10 galleries which are participating to the fair, many of them for the first time this year. So it's always very exciting for us to collaborate with new galleries. We have a focus section which is also dedicated to younger galleries, 12 years and under. And just at a walking distance, there's the event's sister fair, Freeze Masters. Once again, it gives us a contemporary perspective on thousands of years of art history, but with many new additions. And as there's so much to see, sometimes it can get really tiring, even for an art critic. There is a real risk of what's sometimes referred to as fair fatigue where you see so much art that you can't see anything more and it's not processing in your And if you try and see Freeze London and Freeze Masters in the same day, then that is quite the day. So there is a risk of that happening. And it doesn't even end there. Apart from the many galleries one can visit across London, there's also Freeze Sculpture. It's just a step outside of the main fairs in Regent's Park. Eva Longray says many of the artists this year were inspired by this idea of community and getting together. Considering this section is free unlike the other fairs, it seems like a perfect spot for all people to come and enjoy the art together. Let's speak to art historian and critic Jean Wainwright. Hi there Jean, good to have you with us. On showcase. So you were recently there at the Freeze and Jonathan Jones from The Guardian was there too and he wrote a review saying that this is an unexpectedly soulful edition of Freeze. Was that your experience as well? My experience was really interesting. I walked in and I'd been told that the new director was thinking about her mission was to elevate new voices. I walked in and what I saw was colour. I saw vibrancy. I saw lots of galleries putting their best work on show. A really, I felt an elevating experience. People were walking around. They were looking at quirky sculptures. They were looking at neon. They were looking at, at fantastic paintings. But also there were dialogues there. There were things that were provocative to make you think about the world around us, uh, particularly at this time. OK, um, you mentioned, you know, vibrant artworks you saw there at the Freeze. Uh, why are we seeing, you know, a lot of colour this year? Do you think we could read this as a sign of, you know, art world emerging from hibernation after COVID-19? I definitely think that. I think there's a real dynamic going on at the moment. This is the first enormous fair in London since lockdown. It's actually two fairs, as you know, Freeze and Freeze Masters and an outdoor sculpture park. So 
there's a lot going on. And I think people wanted it to feel, certainly the organisers, uplifting. So where there's work that's about messages, political messages, about our environment, etc., they are beautifully presented. They're presented in a way that draws us, us in rather than perhaps repels us. So the messages get across really well. I think there was a lot of abstract art, which was also interesting. And of course, as I say, neon, things vibrating, things moving, funny little humorous dialogues going on. So I think all these things made us really engage with the work, drew us in, I think, in a, in a lovely, elevating way. I mean, I certainly walk around feeling elevated, not feeling, you know, drawn down and, and sad. I felt this was a reflection of people having looked around themselves at nature. And though there were messages about the environment, as I say, and there were very strong messages, there were political messages, somehow it came across as, it, as this lovely place you wanted to be in. Okay, t uh, can you please talk us through how climate change was part of Freeze this year? Yes, I can. Um, British galleries have got together for the Climate Change Coalition. They want to talk about the footprints of galleries at reducing it by 50% in the next 10 years, a big ask. But what you saw around the fairs were little nuances about that. First of all, there's a, a lovely wall of work where people have donated works to be sold um, to help the Climate Coalition, uh, to help fund it. But then there were other works that I really loved. Um, Naomi Goodell's work, which uh, below the uh, Deep South, it's about the rainforest. You look at it, you see a rainforest burning and you think, oh my God, what's this? But Actually, then there's a little hint at the end of what it is. It's not what it seems. Actually, it's layers of, of, of paper that have been um, imprinted with images and they, they're burning, not obviously the real rainforest, but you don't realise that. So it draws you in with a really good message without obviously destroying the environment. But there are other lovely little works um, which, which I particularly liked, drawings, drawings of endangered birds, little paintings, uh, sounds of birds. I thought those things were really... For me, they were really lovely. I just thought there was something about them that made us think about the world around us. Okay. And um, how was the experience like with the, the COVID safety measures that were put into place? Did it, safe, did it feel safe to be there? Yes, very good point. And I'm glad you raised it. Freeze made a lot of effort for us to be safe. So everybody had to either show, obviously, um, a vaccine um, on their phone or whatever, or uh, uh, being tested. And you got a, a band around your, around your wrist. You couldn't enter without that. There were masks given to you at the door. Um, people were wearing masks. And also there was lots of, of safety measures in place. They changed the ventilation system, for example. So there were things that really made you, you feel good. They also restricted numbers. Um, so it felt comfortable, not, you know, not the complete uh, packed freeze that we've seen in the past. I mean, there were a lot of people, but somehow it felt very comfortable. You felt safe. You felt that people were, were looking after our, our health and safety. Okay, well, I understand there was a renewed sense of optimism there at the Freeze Art Fair this year. Does this give you hope about uh, the future of the art world and, you know, this new chapter, the opening that comes after COVID-19? Yes, I'm, I think it's been a very tough time. I think many galleries have had to rethink certainly the carbon footprint, certainly how they travel, certainly restrictions, certainly shipping of artworks. So it was great to see those international galleries. It was great to see people there. It was great to see clients and buyers and art directors and directors of foundations coming. It was also lovely to see the variety of galleries. In fact, Freeze thought that it would be smaller this year and maybe they would amalgamate Freeze and Freeze Masters after the troubles we've 
had, but no, it actually was almost the same size. And that was lovely. And I think that it made galleries really think that there is still a place for these very large art fairs. There is still a position for them, for us to see the real artworks. For a long time, we've been seeing viewing rooms online. You know, we haven't been experiencing these beautiful tactile works that really do need to be seen to appreciate the layers and nuances within the craftsmanship of these works. Okay, well, Jean, we don't have much time left, but uh, before we let you go, uh, what not to miss this year for people who can go to Freeze? Uh, oh. Can you name <laughs> perhaps one artwork that you thought really stood out? Oh, gosh, what's not to miss? You've really put me um, in a spot now. I loved um, Celia Paul's Still Life. I loved Alex de Corta's Neon. I loved Catherine Ryan's Bad Fruit. And I really loved um, uh, Sarah Crowner's paintings. I, I think that I think what I would say to anybody going, just fall in love with some of the artworks. You'll see things that you will just adore. There's something for everyone here. And also there is there is something to make you really relate to art and life, mm -hmm. which after all is is what art does for us. Wow, it was uh, very uplifting to talk to you today, Jean. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you for having me. The Art Air Museum here in Istanbul is celebrating the career of Can Değer Furtun. The ceramicist's career includes teapots, political upheavals and dismembered body parts. Nursena attended the opening of the retrospective and sent in this story. After studying different types of clay for years, Can Değer Furtun decided to make art with it in the 1960s. She exclusively produced ceramics and never sold any of her works. Now, Istanbul's Art and Museum is holding a retrospective exhibition. Two floors of works span six decades. In the 1960s and 70s, her works include things like a ceramic teapot set. But in the 1980s, Fulton started making fragmented human bodies. Loose limbs without definition. The change in her style is linked to Turkey's coup d'etat in 1980. Candar Fulton forms groups of bodies and body parts out of clay. Each one looks alone, but they're together nonetheless. The bodies on the walls give off a sense of warmth. And here, you can almost hear the applause. The message of community is palpable. Fulton said that we can only heal if we stick together as a community. And the sense of unity is very prominent in each gallery room. For the exhibition's curator, Selen Ansan, this is an evolution of the artist's work. John Dear Fulton, who has installed her studio in the 60s in Shishli without moving from it, really, and who has witnessed her time in the studio with her works, um, has also taken life and put it in her works. And I think this porosity, this permeability of her works, of her approach uh, with life has been very decisive in this transition between uh, abstraction and figuration. Ansan also says that the theme of the exhibition, Shell, represents the wall between the individual and the community. She also tells us that, you know, community is not a given thing. It's something you have to build. Although Ansan says Fruton's work doesn't explain how to build a community. Instead, it's meant to stimulate conversation. She doesn't give us an answer about how to build a community or to be together. I think she presents us with the struggles of the individuals to be together, each one and together. 
Although Ansen said the artist was only asking questions on how to become a community without losing the uniqueness of the individual, she and the other organizers of the exhibition said they wished this shell that they exhibit would lead to a social healing. Nur Senat Tar TRT World Istanbul Director Ridley Scott makes larger-than-life action-packed spectacles when it comes to historical movies. He returns to this territory once again with The Last Duel. But Ali Can says Scott's doing things differently this time. If either combatant shall carry on to the field of battle any arms that have been forged with spells... The Last Duel is based on the last officially recognized trial by combat in 1380s France. It follows the tale of Marguerite de Carouge, who claims to have been sexually assaulted by her husband's squire. Director Ridley Scott is a veteran of historical mega-productions. In the past, he has directed such epics like The Gladiator, Robin Hood, and Kingdom of Heaven. All three films share one thing, Scott's spectacle style of filmmaking. Big action set pieces, lengthy swordplay, add Scott's rapidly paced editing, and there you have the formula to his energetic action cinema. But in the last duel, these qualities take a backseat. This time, the director uses character drama instead of action to tell the story, and the camera work acts accordingly to provide a look at medieval French life. What if I lose? I begged you to find another way and now In fact, Empire magazine says it's you. puzzling that there's so little sword fighting in a Scott film about dueling. Scott also abandons his classic Hollywood narrative style. Instead, he dons a Russian-like storytelling device. And the movie unfolds from the perspective of its three lead characters. According to reviews, Scott uses this change in style and narrative for social commentary. They say the film provides a serious critique of misogyny in medieval times. And given that we're living in the age of the Me Too movement, that quality lends the story relevance today. Critics champion the director for making a thought-provoking drama infused with epic grandeur. And that in itself shows Ridley Scott is still a master of historic movies, with or without swords in action. Hollywood's behind-the-scenes workers have announced they will go on strike as of next week unless contract negotiations with producers are resolved. Some 60,000 people are demanding reduced working hours, reasonable rest periods, meal breaks and pay increases. If the strike goes ahead, it will be one of the largest work stoppages in the United States. Squid Game has become the biggest international hit ever on Netflix. The series has topped the charts in 90 countries since its debut. The dystopian drama overtook blockbusters like Bridgerton and Lupin with over 111 million viewers. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the release of the first Harry Potter film. To celebrate the occasion, an installation of nine giant wands has been revealed in central London. The four and a half meter wands are exact replicas of the wands' main characters used in the films. The installation will tour the UK until April next year, just in time for the release of the franchise's latest film, Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore. J.K. Rowling has released her first ever Christmas book. It was inspired by her son's toy pigs. According to Rowling, the Christmas pig is a story about hope and endurance. An exhibition called Game Over has opened in Berlin. Inspired by video games, the event is housed in a former casino that is due for demolition. 80 artists are showcasing analog paintings that are accompanied by an app. By pointing their phones at the artworks, the visitors can see what lies beyond.
The cast of the Emmy-winning drama Succession celebrated the show's third season on the red carpet in New York. Here's a look. <laughs> walking by, he was eating like curly fries out of a cup or something. He walked by, I was like, dude, your show's awesome. And just kept going. And I was like, that's that's a good interaction. I'm a good guy. I'm better than you. We'll beast them. We'll go full beast. It's almost continuous from where we left on season two. And that's the great thing about Jesse's writing and the writers and Tony and Lucy and John, all the writers there, is that sense of continuum that they pick it up straight from where it's left off. So that means that there's the potential is enormous, but also at the same time, the, the road is precise, you know. The Ghostbusters franchise consists of cartoons, a reboot, video games, breakfast cereals and a countless number of costumes. Now, more than 30 years after the original film, the series finally becomes a bona fide trilogy. Ali John has the story. What are you doing here in Somerville anyway? Honestly, my mom won't say it, but we're completely broke. Single mother Callie moves to a small town in Oklahoma with her two kids. They begin to live in a house left by her late father. Around the same time, unusual earthquake activity begins in the town of Somerville, where they reside. It seems like this happening might have something to do with supernatural beings. It's just my mom. And incidentally, before long, the kids find out that their grandfather had ties to the original team of ghoul and goblin chasers, who fought evil of this kind. And to avoid any spoilers, let's just leave it at that for the time being. A town that isn't anywhere near a tectonic plate. A Ghostbusters reboot failed back in 2016. So for Afterlife, Ivan Reitman, the driving force behind the films, decided to go back to the roots of the franchise and complete an actual trilogy. To achieve this, he recruited his son Jason, who acted in Ghostbusters 2, to direct it. Then he got the original cast members to appear. We're closed. There hasn't been a ghost sighting in 30 years. And most importantly, he decided to expand on a story thread that concerns one particular member of the gang. You experience feelings of dread in your basement or attic? And with that, you have a sequel many friends have been calling for, for years, even decades. Reitman and company have been trying to bring closure to the original ghost hunting saga. After ticket returns for Ghostbusters 2 failed at satisfying studio heads, that plan never materialized. The one big pitch for a third film, shopped around by Dan Aykroyd, ended up being the plot for Ghostbusters the video game. It was only after Ivan Reitman persuaded executives that the new film would delve into the past of the much-loved characters with an emphasis on the importance of family that a new movie got greenlit. Despite a fractured consensus about critics, Afterlife is getting positive reviews so far. Empire Magazine's Ollie Richards says Jason Reitman does right to his father's legacy. And he explains that the film is an inventive, fun ride full of charm. Johnny Oleksinski of the New York Post adds that the followers of the franchise will be thrilled with the sequel and calls it a success. And if ticket sales match the enthusiasm of these reviews, then we could see more ghost hunting upon the screens without waiting for another 30 years. This year's Istanbul Photo Awards exhibition has opened in Ankara. 
It features the best shots that covered current affairs around the world in 2020. Let's take a look. The story of Mahmouda from Bangladesh. Mahmouda is in quarantine and she's trying to smell the flowers. Her daughter left her for her birthday through a glass door. Muhammad Shah Jahan, who took Mahmouda's photo, has summarized what we have all been through since 2019 in one shot. We can understand a story of a thousand words in only one photo. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of culture and the art. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.